Emmett Till entered this world in 1941, hailing from the vibrant city of Chicago. His parents were Mamie Carthen and Louis Till. Mamie, originally from the small town of Webb, Mississippi in the Delta region, moved with her family to Argo, Illinois near Chicago when she was two years old. This relocation was part of the Great Migration, a movement of black families from the rural south to the north, driven by a desire to escape violence, limited opportunities, and discriminatory treatment. Mississippi, particularly the Delta counties, faced significant poverty during the 1950s. In 1949, the average income for white households in Tallahatchie County, where Mamie was born, was $690. In stark contrast, black families earned only $462, reflecting the severe economic disparities. Economic prospects for black individuals in rural areas were almost non-existent, as they were often sharecroppers on land owned by white individuals. Furthermore, discriminatory laws and practices, such as racial segregation and voter suppression, had disenfranchised the black community since 1890. Emmett was primarily raised by his mother and grandmother, as Mamie and Louis still separated in 1942 due to Louis's infidelity. Their separation turned violent when Louis assaulted Mamie, causing her to defend herself by throwing scalding water at him. In 1943, Lewis was forced by a court order to choose between jail or enlisting in the U.S. Army for violating the orders to stay away from Mamie. However, in 1945, just a few weeks before Emmett's fourth birthday, Lewis was court-martialed and executed in Italy for the murder of an Italian woman and the sexual assault of two others. At the age of six, Emmett contracted polio, which resulted in a persistent stutter. Mamie and Emmett relocated to Detroit, where Mamie met and married Pink Bradley in 1951. However, Emmett preferred living in Chicago, so he returned to the city to live with his grandmother. Mamie and her husband joined him later that year. Following their separation in 1952, Pink Bradley returned to Detroit alone. Mamie and Emmett resided in a lively neighborhood on Chicago's south side, close to distant relatives. To secure a better income, Mamie began working as a civilian clerk for the U.S. Air Force. She recalled that Emmett was a hard worker, helping with household chores, but sometimes getting easily distracted. She also remembered that he sometimes lacked awareness of his own limitations. During this time, Mamie faced threats from Bradley, prompting Emmett, at the age of 11, to confront him with a butcher knife, vowing to harm him if he did not leave. Despite this turmoil, Emmett generally exuded happiness. He enjoyed playful pranks with his cousins and friends, such as the time he playfully placed his friend's underwear on his head during a car ride. He was also known for his sharp fashion sense and often commanded attention from his peers. During the summer of 1955, Mamie till Bradley's uncle, Mose Wright, paid a visit to Mamie and Emmett in Chicago. He shared stories of his experiences living in the Mississippi Delta, piquing Emmett's curiosity. Determined to see the Delta for himself, Emmett made plans to visit with his cousin, Wheeler Parker, accompanied by another cousin, Curtis Jones, who would join them later. Mose Wright, also known as Preacher, was a sharecropper and part-time minister, residing in Money, a small town in the Delta, located about eight miles north of Greenwood. The town consisted of a few stores, a school, a post office, a cotton gin, and a modest population. Before Emmett embarked on his journey to the Delta, his mother warned him that Chicago and Mississippi were two distinct worlds, emphasizing the importance of his behavior in the presence of white individuals in the South. Emmett assured her that he understood the gravity of the situation. Since the collection of lynching statistics began in 1882, Mississippi alone has witnessed the extrajudicial killings of over 500 African Americans, with more than 3,000 across the entire South. Although these racially motivated murders were less frequent by the mid-1950s, they still occurred. Throughout the South, laws were in place to forbid interracial relationships, serving as a means to uphold white supremacy. Even the mere suggestion of any contact between black men and white women could result in severe consequences for black men. 
A resurgence of enforcing such Jim Crow laws became evident after World War II when African American veterans started advocating for equal rights in the South. Racial tensions escalated following the landmark 1954 ruling by the United States Supreme Court in Brown v. Board of Education, which declared segregation in public education unconstitutional. Many segregationists vehemently opposed this decision, fearing it would lead to interracial dating and marriage. In response, some jurisdictions ignored the ruling, while others took more drastic measures, such as closing public schools to prevent integration. Meanwhile, white communities continued to employ various methods to maintain the political disenfranchisement of black individuals, a state they had endured since the early 1900s. Segregation was a powerful tool employed in the South to enforce social inequality on blacks. Just a week before Till's arrival in Mississippi, Lamar Smith, a black activist involved in political organizing, was shot and killed in front of the county courthouse in Brookhaven. Although three white suspects were arrested, they were swiftly released. On August 21, 1955, Emmett Till arrived at the home of Mose and Elizabeth Wright in Money, Mississippi. On the evening of August 24, Till, along with some young relatives and neighbors, went to Bryant's Grocery and Meat Market to buy candy. They were driven to the store by Till's cousin Maurice Wright. The group consisted of children from sharecropper families who had been working in the cotton fields all day. The market catered mainly to the local sharecropper community and was owned by a white couple, 24-year-old Roy Bryant and his 21-year-old wife Carolyn. At the time, Carolyn was alone in the front of the store, while her sister-in-law Juanita Milam was in the rear, looking after children. There were other local youths present, engaged in playing or watching a checkers game set up by the Bryants outside the store. The details of what transpired inside the store are still a subject of dispute. Journalist William Bradford Huey reported that Till showed a photograph of a white girl in his wallet to the youths outside the store, claiming she was his girlfriend. However, Till's cousin Curtis Jones stated that the photograph was from an integrated class at Till's school in Chicago. According to Huey and Jones, one or more of the local boys then dared Till to speak to Bryant. However, Till's cousin Simeon Wright, who was present, contradicted Huey and Jones' accounts in his 2009 book. Wright asserted that Till did not have a photo of a white girl and that no one dared him to flirt with Bryant. Wright stated that it was the white community who spread those claims and that they had never spoken to him or interviewed him. The FBI report completed in 2006 noted that Jones recanted his 1955 statements prior to his death and apologized to Mamie Till Mobley, Emmett Till's mother. According to Simeon Wright and Wheeler Parker, Till Wolf whistled at Bryant. Wright believed that Till did it to provoke laughter or amusement. However, Wright immediately became alarmed by the action, stating that they were shocked and afraid, as they had never heard of such behavior before, a black boy whistling at a white woman in Mississippi was unheard of. Wright mentioned that the presence of the Ku Klux Klan and Knight Riders was a daily reality for them. Some newspaper accounts after Till's disappearance suggested that he sometimes whistled to alleviate his stuttering, as he had difficulty pronouncing certain sounds. Till's mother mentioned that she taught him to softly whistle to himself before speaking to improve his articulation. During the murder trial, Carolyn Bryant testified that Till grabbed her hand while she was stocking candy and made advances, asking her for a date. She claimed that, after freeing herself from his grasp, Till followed her to the cash register, grabbed her waist, and made derogatory comments. She alleged that Till said he had been with white women before. Bryant also accused one of Till's companions of coming into the store, grabbing Till's arm, and ordering him to leave. However, historian Timothy Tyson revealed in a 2008 interview that Bryant admitted her testimony during the trial about Till's advances was false. Bryant said that that part's not true and that she couldn't remember the rest of what happened. According to Bryant's daughter-in-law, who was present during Tyson's interviews, Bryant never made the statement about Till's actions justifying his fate. 
Decades later, Simeon Wright challenged Carolyn Bryant's account during the trial, stating that he entered the store less than a minute after Till was left alone with her and witnessed no inappropriate behavior or lecherous conversation. Wright asserted that Till paid for his items, and they left the store together. The FBI's 2006 investigation into the case noted that a second anonymous source, who was present in the store at the same time as Till and his cousin, supported Wright's account. It was acknowledged that after Till and Wright left the store, Carolyn Bryant went outside to retrieve a pistol from a car. Till and his companions observed this and left immediately. It is known that Till whistled while Bryant was going to her car, but one witness, Roosevelt Crawford, claimed that Till's whistle was directed at the checkers game outside the store, not at Bryant. Roy Bryant, Carolyn's husband, was away on a shrimp hauling trip to Texas and did not return home until August 27. According to historian Timothy Tyson, civil rights activists investigating the case concluded that Carolyn Bryant initially did not inform her husband about the encounter with Till. Roy was reportedly told by someone who frequented their store. Carolyn Bryant told the FBI that she did not tell her husband because she feared he would assault Till. When Roy Bryant received news of the incident, he aggressively interrogated several young black men who entered his store. Later that evening, Bryant, accompanied by a black man named J. W. Washington, approached a black teenager walking along a road. Bryant instructed Washington to apprehend the boy, place him in the back of a pickup truck, and took him to be identified by a companion of Carolyn, who had witnessed the encounter with Till. The boy's friends or parents vouched for him at Bryant's store, while Carolyn's companion refuted the claim that the boy Bryant and Washington had seized was the same person who had interacted with her. However, Bryant somehow discovered that the boy involved in the incident was from Chicago and was staying with Mose Wright. Overheard conversations revealed Bryant and his half-brother, John William J. W. Millam, discussing their plan to take Till from his house. In the early hours of August 28, 1955, between 2 and 3.30 a.m., Bryant and Milam drove to Mose Wright's house. Milam carried a pistol and a flashlight. Milam asked Wright if there were three boys from Chicago in the house. Till was sharing a bed with another cousin, and a total of eight people were present in the cabin. Milam requested that Wright lead them to the one who did the talking. In an attempt to dissuade them, Till's great aunt offered them money, but Milam refused as he hurried Emmett to dress. Mose Wright informed the men that Till was from the north and didn't know any better. Milam then threatened Wright, asking him his age and warning him that if he spoke to anyone, he wouldn't live to see 65. They forcibly tipped Till to the truck, where someone in the car confirmed that he was the boy they were looking for. Had they followed their initial plan, Bryant and Milam would have brought Till to the store for Carolyn to identify him. However, they claimed in a 1956 interview with Look Magazine, where they confessed to the killing, that they didn't do so because Till admitted to being the person who had spoken to her. They tied Till up in the back of a green pickup truck and drove towards Money, Mississippi. Witnesses report that they returned to Bryant's groceries, recruited two black men, and headed to a barn in Drew. During the journey, they assaulted Till, knocking him unconscious. Willie Reed, an 18-year-old at the time, witnessed the truck passing by. He saw two white men in the front seat and two black males in the back. Some speculate that the black men were compelled to assist with the beating, although they later denied being present. While walking home, Willie Reed heard the sounds of beating and crying coming from the barn. He informed a neighbor, and together they returned to a water well near the barn, where they encountered Milam. Milam asked if they heard anything, to which Reed replied, no. Others also passed by the shed and heard shouting. A local neighbor spotted two tight, Leroy Collins, washing blood off the truck at the back of the barn and noticed Till's boot. Milam explained that they had killed a deer and that the boot belonged to him. Some assert that Till was shot and thrown over the Black Bayou Bridge in Glendora, Mississippi, near the Tallahatchie River. The group then returned to Roy Bryant's home in Money, where they reportedly burned Emmett's clothes. 
In an interview with William Bradford Huey for Look magazine in 1956, Bryant and Millem claimed that their intention was to beat Till and throw him off an embankment into the river to frighten him. They told Huey that during the beating, Till insulted them, asserted his equality, and boasted about having had relations with white women. They placed Till in the back of their truck and drove to a cotton gin to take a 70-pound fan, the only moment when they admitted feeling worried, fearing that someone might spot them stealing in the early daylight. They drove along the river for several miles, searching for a place to dispose of Till. Finally, they shot him by the river and weighed down his body with the fan. Mose Wright waited on his front porch for 20 minutes, expecting Till's return. He didn't go back to bed. Wright and another man drove to money, obtained gasoline, and searched for Till. Unsuccessful, they returned home by 8 a.m. After learning from Wright that he feared for his life and wouldn't contact the police, Curtis Jones made a call to the LaFleur County Sheriff and another to his mother in Chicago. Distressed, she contacted Emmett's mother, Mamie Till Bradley. Wright and his wife Elizabeth drove to Sumner, where Elizabeth's brother contacted the sheriff. LaFleur County Sheriff George Smith interrogated Bryant and Millam. They admitted to taking the boy from his great uncle's yard but claimed they had released him the same night in front of Bryant's store. Bryant and Millam were arrested for kidnapping. As news spread about Till's disappearance, Medgar Evers, Mississippi State Field Secretary for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People (NAACP), and Amzie Moore, head of the NAACP's Bolivar County chapter, joined the effort. Disguised as cotton pickers, they ventured into the cotton fields in search of any information that could help locate Till. Three days after his abduction and murder, Till's severely disfigured and swollen body was discovered by two boys fishing in the Tallahatchie River. His head bore severe mutilations, a gunshot wound above his right ear, an eye dislodged from its socket, signs of beatings on his back and hips, and his body was weighed down by a fan blade secured around his neck with barbed wire. Till was found naked, except for a silver ring engraved with the initials L, T, and May 25, 1943. His face was unrecognizable due to trauma and being submerged in water. Moe's Wright was summoned to the river to identify Till. The silver ring was removed from Till's finger, returned to Wright, and subsequently handed over to the district attorney as evidence. The trial took place in the county courthouse in Sumner, which was the western seat of Tallahatchie County due to the location where Till's body was discovered. The trial attracted significant media attention, with reporters from all over the country descending upon the small town. It was considered the first major media event of the civil rights movement. The lack of available hotels meant that no accommodations were open to black visitors. Mamie Till Bradley, Till's mother, arrived to testify, and the trial also drew the presence of black congressman Charles Diggs from Michigan. Bradley, Diggs, and several black reporters stayed at the home of T. R. M. Howard in Mound Bayou, which resembled a fortified compound, surrounded by armed guards. A day before the trial began, a young black man named Frank Young approached Howard, revealing that he knew of two witnesses to the crime. These witnesses, Levi Tutai Collins and Henry Lee Loggins, were black employees of Leslie Millam, the brother of J. W. Millam, in whose shed till was beaten. The prosecution was unaware of Collins and Loggins, and Sheriff Strider booked them into jail in Charleston, Mississippi, to prevent them from testifying. The trial took place in September 1955 and lasted for five days, during which the weather was oppressively hot. The courtroom was packed with 280 spectators, with segregated sections for black attendees. Major national newspapers and black publications sent reporters, with black journalists required to sit separately from the white press and farther from the jury. The courtroom atmosphere was characterized by informality, with jury members allowed to drink beer and many white male spectators openly carrying handguns. The defense aimed to create doubt about the identity of the body found in the river, suggesting it couldn't be positively identified and questioning whether Till was actually dead. They argued that Bryant and Millam had released Till after taking him from his great uncle's house. 
The defense attorneys also sought to challenge the identification made by Mose Wright, who testified that he saw Bryant and Milam take Till. They highlighted that only Milam's flashlight was in use that night, and Wright had only seen Milam clearly. Wright's testimony was considered exceptionally courageous, as it was rare for a black man in the South to testify against a white man in court and survive. Journalist James Hicks, present in the courtroom, was particularly struck by Wright's identification of Milam, describing it as a historic and electrifying moment. Mamie Till Bradley testified, discussing her instructions to her son and facing scrutiny over the identification of Till's body and an insurance policy she had taken out on him. During the trial, efforts were made to locate Collins and Loggins, but they could not be found. However, three witnesses who had seen them with Milam and Bryant on Leslie Milam's property testified. They described hearing sounds of a beating, blows, and cries. Sheriff Strider, testifying for the defense, maintained his theory that Till was alive and that the body retrieved from the river was white. A doctor from Greenwood stated that the decomposed state of the body made identification impossible, suggesting it had been in the water too long to be Till. Carolyn Bryant was allowed to testify in court, but her testimony was deemed irrelevant to Till's abduction and murder, and the jury was not present. However, her testimony was recorded for potential use in an appeal if the defendants were convicted. In the closing statements, one prosecuting attorney acknowledged Till's wrongdoing but argued that it warranted a spanking, not murder. Gerald Chatham passionately called for justice and criticized the sheriff and doctor's statements about a conspiracy. The defense countered by presenting the prosecution's theory as improbable and appealing to the jury's sense of heritage. In Mississippi, three outcomes were possible for capital murder, life imprisonment, the death penalty, or acquittal. After just a 67-minute deliberation, the all-white, all-male jury, excluding women and blacks, acquitted both defendants. Some jurors later admitted that they believed Bryant and Milam were guilty but did not consider life imprisonment or the death penalty appropriate punishment for white men who had killed a black man. Two jurors even maintained their belief in the defense's case as late as 2005. In post-trial analyses, criticism was directed at Mamie Till Bradley for her perceived lack of emotion on the stand. The jury selection process came under scrutiny as it heavily favored individuals from the Hill Country section of Tallahatchie County, known for its intense racism. The prosecution was criticized for dismissing potential jurors who knew the defendants personally, fearing they would vote to acquit. However, in hindsight, it was recognized that those who knew the defendants often held negative opinions of them. One juror initially voted to convict, but eventually sided with the rest of the jury to acquit. Some jurors acknowledged that they knew Bryant and Milam were guilty but questioned whether Till had died and if the body recovered from the river was his. In November 1955, a grand jury decided not to indict Bryant and Milam for kidnapping, despite their own admissions of taking Till. Mose Wright and a witness named Willie Reed testified before the grand jury, but no charges were brought. T.R.M. Howard covered the relocation expenses of Wright, Reed, and another black witness to Chicago to protect them from potential reprisals. Reed, who changed his name to Willie Lewis to avoid being found, lived in the Chicago area until his death in 2013. He kept his involvement in the case secret from his wife until it was revealed by a relative. Reed later spoke publicly about the case in the PBS documentary The Murder of Emmett Till, which aired in 2003.